sun descends like a dove and baptizes with fire. He comforts, guides, and corrects. He is the spirit of life, the essence of truth, the voice of God. And when you are alone, lost, and afraid, he will carry you home. Well, hi, guys. It is good to be with you. Well, this is the weekend that <clears throat> Halloween happens, and so we decided to use the holiday to talk about some spiritual matters. You know, it was, uh, as I approached this holiday, it was making me think back to when uh, Pastor and Andy and I first started in the ministry. We were both pretty young. We were living down in the Dam Neck area, and so we had moved into the area, and we were trying to get to know our neighbors, <clears throat> things like that. Well, it turns out that there was a coven of witches in that, uh, in that area, and they did not like us there. <laughs> How do I know that? Well, on Halloween, uh, they delivered a um, cat. I guess they had sacrificed a black cat and put it on my doorstep, right? So that's sad, but that's what, that's what happens during this holiday. It's a high holiday for Satan's church, and they will express themselves that way. But, you know, for most of us, that's not the case, is it? Most of us, we think about the holiday and we think about fun. We think about getting along with our friends and our neighbors and, you know, uh, just maybe dressing up, having fun food, things like that, right? And so we look forward to the holiday. Matter of fact, some of my young people, a lot of my young people, they even like to watch the scary movies, right? Like, uh, was it Friday the 13th and uh, was it something on Elmer's Street? I don't know because I don't watch them, right? They always are intriguing with my young adults. Come and watch them. I'm like, no. And I have a reason. I'll tell you about it in a moment. I'm like, no, not going to do that. But I know that that's part of the fun of this season, right? And so we, we have that uh, custom that we have in America. And most of us understand Halloween in light of that, right? And so I enjoy a party just as much as you do. And I love, you know, working especially with kids and providing for them. So to me, uh, Halloween is a time where I, I just absolutely love to go out into my um, front of my house and have a big bowl of candy, right? And so I love when the little ones come up, you know, and they trick or treat with me uh, to uh, ask them all about their costume, why they choose what they, you know, chose. And then I let them pick out their candy, and it's so fun to watch them. One, okay. Two, yeah. Okay, four, five, boom, right? It was just really a lot of fun. It just blesses my heart, right? It's a fun time of the uh, year for me with that. Now, it, I tell you, most of you know that uh, Pastor and Andy and I are now grandparents. Yay, right? Yeah, yeah, it took a while to get there. <clears throat> anyway, my son, my son Samuel and his wife Olivia delivered their little girl uh, last month. Her name is Lily, baby Lily. And of course, we were approaching this holiday, and so her mom dressed her up, and I gotta show her to you, because I'm a proud grandpa. Here you go. <laughs> She's like, come on, Nana, bring, bring the candy, right? <laughs> yes, I love this, I love this. So there are fun things to do during this time, but it behooves us to understand that the basis of this holiday is really about bringing out the truth uh, or bringing out the, about death and dying, right? That afterlife experience, and then also the spiritual things that go on. And so those are the things I want to talk to you today. And that's kind of what the, uh, the message, the ghost, is all related to this. So it's always my practice to start with prayer. So I'm going to ask you to uh, just bow your heads here, and I'm going to ask for the Holy Spirit to come. Okay? Father God, I thank you for being here, your presence. Yep. So, Father God, I just ask that this principality, this area, Father, that you would be in charge of it and that you would push back anything that the enemy would try to bring in, that the ears would be open to hear what your spirit has to say, Father, and that you'd move upon your people. You say you know every hair on their head, that you would move upon them, Lord, and that you would begin to bring truth and freedom into their lives. Now, Father, I give you this message. Come and do what only you can do. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for partnering up with me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
So I do want to talk to you about, um, you know, about death and the afterlife and, and being able to look at, uh, you know, the spiritual aspects of stuff. But in order for us to really understand and grab hold, especially of, of death and the afterlife, is you need to know a few things. So I'm going to do a backdrop. And there's more material than I could ever teach in this given time. So I put it on your outline for you to go back and to look at later. I won't cover all those verses, but I wanted you to be armed so that you could do your own personal study, okay? So the first thing I think we need to know when we look at the uh, death process and the afterlife is we need to understand what life is, and we need to know that God created life. He created it. And we can read about this in the Bible, in the Hebraic teaching that we see in Genesis 2, 7, right? It says this, then the Lord God formed a man. This isn't gender specific. What that is, man is mankind. It's humankind, okay? So he formed a man from the dust of the ground, taking the elements. He formed him, right? And he breathed, this is important, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, right? Now that's the spiritual element. And the man became a living being. So God created us right? He creates us in his own image. And so like God, we are, right? So we are, we are body. We have a body. We have also a soul. And a soul, what's that? What's that? Because the body is the elements. The soul is the part of us that is our mind, right? Our heart, right? So it's our thinking and our feeling parts, but it's also the will, the desire to do things, all right? And so that makes up that soul. And then Beside that, he then deposits the spirit in us, and that's what gives us life. And so we all know that these elements exist. And in our today thinking, it's very, we're very linear, you know, in our thought process. But you see in the Hebraic writings and teachings, they're more reciprocal, meaning they fall back on each other all the time. So they're not so easily pulled apart. But the conversation today, I'm going to pull them apart and try to make them easy so that we can understand them, Okay. All right, good. So here you go. So what happens here is that God creates life. He creates us. But we know that in the Bible, it talks about man, uh, mankind deciding he wants to be his own God, that he wants to be in charge, right? He wants to call his own shots. And so he listens to the enemy, which is Satan, talking to them. And so you see the first act of disobedience happens with Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And so what happens at that point is the disobedience causes the spirit to darken and to deaden, right? And so now there's this disconnection. And it's not just the time that happened then. It goes throughout history. It cascades. And that's where we find ourselves today where we're full of of sin and, and we have a hard time making good choices and things like that, right? And so it's this sin nature that we have that that we struggle against. And so God in his wisdom knew this. And so he wants to answer it for us, how we can find freedom. And you can see it in Romans 3.24. It says this, anyone can be made right with God by the free gift. We don't have to earn this. It's a free gift of his loving favor, which is God. It is Jesus Christ. Here's the free gift. It's Jesus Christ who bought them with his blood. Okay, he bought them with the blood and made them free for their, from their sins. And so what we see here is that Jesus Christ is the reason that we can be made, the spark of life can become alive again, can be born again. Okay, and it only comes through Jesus Christ. And this has to be understood to be able to be embraced. So you see this, all this work of salvation. I want you to clearly understand this. The work of salvation that's done through Jesus Christ is nothing that you or I do. All we do is acknowledge that it's been done for us. And we must acknowledge it because if we don't acknowledge it, then we can't partic- you know, participate in it. So we have to acknowledge it. And the moment we acknowledge it, he goes, I love you. You're right here with me. And we don't ever lose it. God is always there. Our spirit becomes alive and is sensitive. We are connected to the divine again, right? So this is very, very important. What I'm describing is called justification. It's just as if I didn't sin because of what Jesus Christ did for us, right? But then it goes on beyond that because that God wants us to understand that's a free gift. And then he says, hey, I want you to be sanctified. And that's going to require some energy on our behalf because he gives us a purpose, right? He wants to restore relationships and things like that. So we undergo that process of discovering the the purpose he has for our lives. And it's not just for our own self, 
You see, you were meant to be in the body of Christ. You were meant to participate in a church because that's God's body here on earth, right? And we're meant to be a part of that and to find out how we will uh, get that, that message out to the community around us. And so this is what God says life is. This is what life is. So then what happens at death? Let's talk about that. God's got it. He says God's going to manage death, right? And so when we talked about, we opened up with that Genesis scripture, right? Well, you're going to see where the physical body, it stops to exist as we understand it. And so what you're going to see here in Ecclesiastes, it talks about it. It says here, and the dust returns to the ground. That's the body. It returns to the ground and it, from when it came. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. So God gave us his spirit, and that returns back to him. Now, here's the interesting part. Here's the interesting part. This is the mystery, right, for me and for, for everybody who reads the Bible. You see, we are this soul. The soul is the, the personhood of who we are, right? It's the accumulation of all our thoughts and our emotions and our will. It's, it's all here. And so I believe when the body dies, that the soul actually goes with the spirit because they're intertwined, and they go up to the Lord. Does that make sense? That they're intertwined. You cannot separate them out. Again, a linear thought says one, two, three. But in Hebraic teaching, they all fall upon each other, right? And so what we see is this intertwined uh, between our soul and, uh, and the spirit, and that is going to go up to heaven, right? It's going to go before God because it has to undergo this process. It says, just as people are destined to die, how many times? Once, no reincarnation. Just as people are des uh, destined to die once and after that be face the judgment, right? To face the judgment. So that means everybody in here, when you die, you are going to go face the judgment. Ugh. <laughs> right? It's like going to the principal's office. <laughs> it can be pretty scary in your brain, right? But you see, if you know the principal, you know what's going on, you're not afraid. Okay? And so what's going to, this judgment is going to look at your life and how you spent your life, right? That's what's happening in judgment. And so we need to know in John, it tells us about the judgment. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Okay? If you are a Christ follower, you have eternal life because of this. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Why? For the disobedience from Adam and Eve, it continues to remain on them. Do you see that? And so we need to know that, that uh, there is an afterlife. Okay, hear me clearly. There is an afterlife. And in that afterlife, you're going to go before God, and you're going to stand there, and you only have two options. Do you know Jesus Christ? And if you do, you're going to go to be with him in heaven. And if you do not, if you do not pronounce Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what happens is you get eternally separated. And we have a word for that. That word is hell. Yes. Okay? And I know it's not a popular word, but that's what the Word of God says. So, okay, so you guys need to get, get that part. And so it's important to know uh, what's going to happen. And this is so important for you to understand this, right? Then I'm going to describe it this way to you because this is how I see it. There will come a day when Sharon Me dies, right? When my body stops to exist uh, in its form that we know now, and the spirit is going to go with the soul, and they're going to go before God Almighty, the holy God, the creator of the universe, and a little old me is going to go right in front of him and stand there. And I've got to give an account on how I've spent my life, the things I've done. And the word of God says that none, none of us, are good enough, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, including Sharon Mead. So I am not holy enough. I'm not good enough. I don't have the absence of sin. I cannot stand before God. It just can't. So when I'm there, before I can say a word, an arm is going to come around me. It's going to pull me in. And when I look, who is that? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And before I can say anything, Jesus is going to look at the Father and say, Father, this one's ours. This one belongs to us, right? And so I don't have to give an explanation of my whole life and the mess-ups and all the things. You don't have to do that. You see, because I'm not getting in on my own merits. There's nothing I can do. This is all about what Christ has already done in my life. 
And I am fully loved and accepted by the Father because of that. It's very clear. This makes sense to you. And so we need to understand in the death process that we go immediately before him for him to judge us. And if we have Jesus, then the option is we go to eternity with him, which is heaven. If we don't, then the eternity that we face is hell. It's separation from God. That's what hell means, right? And so those are the two options. There's no third and fourth and fifth option. So here's myth busters. Here's things that aren't going to happen. You're not going to, uh, you're not going to be sent to a purgatory, a, a place of just hanging out until somebody like the saints could pray you back up and into good graces. That's not, that's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. Nor is reincarnation. Like, dang, Skippy, I didn't do so well in this life, so I get to do another one. And if I don't do good in that one, I get to be an animal next. Right? There's, that, that's, that's not true. That's not what the Word of God says. There is no recreation, you know, where you're recreated again and again. Nor is there soul wandering. You know, where somebody dies and their soul loves the person so much or their life, right? Or they get, just get lost. And so they never appear before God. No, 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 no. We go straight to God. We go straight to God. How do I know that? Because Jesus said that to the thief on this cross, you know, that accepted him as his Savior. He said, today, not tomorrow, not 15, today you will be with me in paradise. You see that? And so we go right before him. So there's no soul wondering and this idea of zombies, oh my goodness, <laughs> right? Where there's this human form that doesn't have a soul and it walks around and eats people, you know? No, that's Hollywood conflating stuff, right? There is no soulless human being, right? And that has great implication on things uh, that we're seeing now even happening, like with cloning and stuff like that. So if you've got the right understanding, you can handle things like that. You can actually talk to it. And the other thing I want to dispel right now where we're at is there's no such thing as extinction, right? Where you just die, your body goes back in the ground, your soul, your spirit, and it just, you're done, right? You just go back into the earth. No, there's an afterlife. How do I know that? Because the Word of God tells me that there is. And so we need to understand that. We need to understand what's happening in death, in life, and the afterlife, right? Okay, so now there, people are going, okay, well, that's fine and dandy, but what about the paranormal? What about if I participate or somebody I know participates, you know, with practices of talking to the dead or, you know, calling in spirits and stuff, and, and sometimes they say stuff that's true. I mean, what's all that about? Is that real or fake, Sharon? Great question, great question. So that's what we're going to look at next. It says, uh, God discourages uh, goblins, <laughs> ghosts, or ghouls, goblins, and ghosts, right? And so all of those are referring to the paranormal. And you can put whatever name you, you want to that. Do I think that there is a spiritual realm out there that we need to be understanding? You betcha. Yeah, I betcha I do. Here it is in, in Ephesians. It says this. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Here you go, flesh and blood. We're not fighting against that, right? But against evil rulers and authorities of the what? Unseen world, spiritual, unseen world. Against mighty powers in the dark world, meaning that there is a dark world. And against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So this tells me that there is an entity that's allowed to exist, that's spiritual in nature, that does interact with us here on earth. Ooh, I just blew some people's mind. <laughs> like, I liked you, but now I don't know, <laughs> right? No, there is a spiritual entity. You know, G uh, the scriptures taught it about it. Jesus even talked about it, right? And so we need to know that there is these spiritual entities. I mean, if you really spent time in the Word of God, you would be able to see where there's a lot of interaction with spiritual beings, right? And the forces that, that uh, do things to people. One of these I was thinking about is uh, the time that Jesus confronts the demoniac, right? The, the demon from Gadarean, demoniac is what it's called. And so there's a time when he interacts with him, and it's in Luke 8. And if you've never read it, you want to go read it, especially with Halloween, right? Right, okay. So when you're reading this story, 
Uh, this is an actual counting that the disciples have written down that happened with Jesus. You know, he's coming over with his disciples on a boat, and they're going to get off in this, in this land, uh, the Gadarean land, right? And so they're going to get off and, and go and talk to the people and tell them about the good news, right? Which is what they had been doing. But they are going to encounter a ghoul, a goblin, whatever you want to call him, right? They're going to encounter a spiritual force and they're going to be, have, have some pushback. And I want you to know this, right? When they come off, this guy is described as a human being, but he's described in such terms that you know there's another thing that's at play. Because when the townspeople are afraid of him and they bind him up with chains and all, he's able to break chains, right? Nothing can constrain him. And he'd rather live in isolation amongst the tool, you know, the tombs. And he'd rather cut himself and he's naked, wondering and whining and yelling and crying out at night, okay? So you get this picture of somebody who's totally just, it's bizarre, just bizarre, right? And so anyway, so Jesus comes with his little disciples. They hit the shore. They come off. And the first thing is this this uh, demon-possessed person comes running at Jesus, right? And he gets there, and, and Jesus doesn't have to say a word. He just stops. What? And he looks at Jesus, and he says, Jesus, Son of God. So even the demons recognize Jesus. It's Jesus, Son of God. What are you doing here, right? And so now he's concerned about his welfare, right? And so the, the, the demon that has this man, Jesus talks to him, and he says, uh, who are you? And then the demon responds, uh, legion, indicating that there were many multiples of evil entities that were in this person, right? And so now you're getting the fullness of it. It's like, whoa. And then before Jesus could say anything else, the evil spirit says, hey, have you come to send us in the abyss? Have you come to, to put us in the abyss, which is like their hell, Right? Have you come to do that to us? And I think that indicates what God thinks about evil spirits, right? That that's their place that they will be put in. But at this moment in time, the evil spirits are saying, please don't do that, you know? Instead, cast us out and into the swine because they didn't want to just float in the air, right? How do I know they float in the air? Because Satan is the prince of the air, right? And so they didn't want to just be without a person because they like to inhabit people, right? You need to hear this. They like to inhabit people. So Jesus said, okay, go in the swine, right? And so it's like, uh, you know, a thousand pigs on the hill. And the moment the, the evil spirits entered the pigs, you know what they did? They went crazy. They ran down the hill and they drowned themselves, right? Because that's what evil does. It knows to destruction. And so we see this accounting of what's happening here in the scriptures, right? And so I want you to know that it has implication. It teaches us things. It's not just a story, isn't that cruel, right? But it has implications. You see, when you confront an evil spirit, you have power. It's not like the world that says you have no power and the evil wins. That's not true. Those of us that are Christ followers, we have power in the name of Jesus Christ, in the blood of Christ, right? To be able to speak to to the evil forces that come at us or come at anybody, right? But you must do it through Jesus Christ because they'll beat you up by yourself, right? Scripture tells us that too. And so we need to know that we have this power. Also, I've come to realize that in this story, the townspeople, they come out to see this miracle that Jesus did. It's like, whoa. Yes, they come out to investigate, right? Because nobody can control this man. And they find out what he's done, the power he has over these demons. I'm going to tell you, they said, get out of here, Jesus. We don't want you to work in this area. And I was thinking, are you kidding me? Right? And then I began to realize, no, there are principalities that have the power in certain places. And the power that they have usually has an origin or a name, and it controls the culture of that particular place. Right? And so... What, what uh, Jesus was doing is he knew that the principality had to be taken care of. Do you understand that? So the, out, the outset that we see, though, is what happened with the man. Now, the man, when the demons were cast out, well, he becomes in his right mind, and he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And then Jesus, he wants to go with Jesus because, you know, <laughs> look where I was and look where I am, right? He wants to go, but Jesus says, no, no, no. 
stay here because you know what the culture produces and you're going to speak into it. So that was the evangelist that was born there for those people. Do you see that? This is huge. You, I could go on and on and on about what the Word of God says. Yet I know some of you would sit here and go, oh, that's in the Bible. Does it really happen today? Yeah, it sure does. It sure does. You know, before the pandemic, we were having bigger crowds, and, and we were praying up front after one of the services. And I was over here praying with some folks, and some of my prayer people, uh, they came over to get me, and they said, Pastor Sharon, this lady wants us to pray for her, but we're confused. We don't know how to do it, right? And these are strong prayer warriors. And I thought, well, that's different. And so I finished up, and I started walking over, and I said, God, what is it going on? Holy Spirit, what's happening? And the Holy Spirit said, unclean spirit. I was like, oh, okay. What do you want me to do about that, right? And as I'm walking, the Lord says, what you will do is you'll look her right in the eye and you'll say to the spirit to be quiet because I'm going to give you words to tell her. And I was like, okay. So I walk over there with my big smile thinking, oh boy. And so <clears throat> when, I, when I started, started to talk to her, I did what the father told me to do. I looked her straight in the eye. And the moment I looked her in the eye, she yells out in a very loud voice, I'm going to throw up. And I look, I thought, no, you're not in the name of Jesus, you know, taking authority, right? My prayer people are running around trying to find a bucket just in case. And I'm like, oh boy. But you know what? I didn't spoke to the, the evil thing that was going on and I quieted it and God gave a word and I gave it to her, right? And at the end of our time together, we actually gave her a Bible. We talked with her and she went on her way. Well, you know, I was like, Father, why didn't you just have me, you know, uh, tell that demon to get out of her and to go away and stuff. I mean, why, why stop? Where were we at? And so then the father did something remarkable. He came and talked to me about this. He said, Sharon, I didn't want you to do that because you had one demon, and that demon would have left her and went and found seven more and came inside of her, and her condition would have been worse off than what it was when you were talking to her. I was like, oh, and there's scripture behind this, guys. This isn't just manufacturer up here, you manufacture it's actually in scripture. I was like, oh, okay. And come to find out she was uh, a witch. She'd been practicing witchcraft. Guys, God wants to come and he wants to talk to us. He wants to talk to us. He wants you to wake up to realize that there's a spiritual world that's around you, to understand it. Not that it controls us and brings fear, but that we understand our part in that spiritual realm right? And so we need to understand that. And one of the statements I'm going to say is going to seem kind of harsh, but it, it is so true. All spiritual forces like that are evil. Let me say them again. All spiritual forces are evil. You're kidding. There's no good witch and bad witch. The white witch has good ethics. The bad witch has bad, right? What about the person that comes and they look like Aunt Betty, right? Uncle Bob. Are they bad? Listen again. All spiritual forces like that are evil. They come from Satan. And if you know anything about Satan, he comes to kill, destroy, and to lie to you. And so today I'm up here boldly proclaiming because I love you. And I do not want to see you at the leisure of Satan where he can bring confusion and mental illness and cause you great pain. Right? Because you lent in and you leaned into the wrong thing. And so as a shepherd of the people, I'm telling you, don't go there. Right? And so the word very clearly, very clearly says, you and I are not to participate in, in uh, fortune telling. Right? We're not to participate in deviation where, where we're calling the dead, right? Through mediums or seances. He says, don't do that. Right? He says, don't have your palm read right? He says, don't do that. Now, here we go. This is going to really step on some toes. He says, don't do the astrology thing. He says, don't do those. Those separate you. You're not to be active with witches and warlocks. All of these entities are evil. They've got their base in Satan, and Satan wants to hurt you. He does. He wants to hurt you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to lie to you. But you see, God wants to come and to bring you life and to bring it to you abundantly. And so he wants you to choose that instead. And so today I'm calling out and challenging you. If you're in those practices, come away. Come away and protect yourself. 
If you want to talk to me, I'm always around to talk to you. Now, there's this matter of angels, right? I don't believe angels are evil. But here you go. Angels are God's workmen. They are his creation that he uses to bring messages and to accomplish certain things on earth, right, for special occasions, and so he'll do that. He will actually have, he actually has angels. And we see that all through scripture where they, they pop up, like the Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, when, you know, the angel Gabriel came to her and said, you will, you know, have this child, right? And so you see it over and over with the angels interface. And here you go, again, that interfacing happens today. It happens today. We entertain angels and we're unaware of them because God doesn't want us to really be aware. I think of an issue or an incident that I had a couple of years ago where I was invited in to, uh, to be with a man uh, at the end life, right? His children asked me to go. He did not know Christ. And so when I was there, it became they pulled him off a of life support. And most people just passed away uh, quietly, but not him. He began to writhe in pain. And fear overtook him. And he was like a man drowned, and you could see it in his eyes, and like a man who had his, his body on fire. And so something was wrong, and the family asked me and said, please help him. And the only thing I knew to do was to tell him about Jesus. And so that was my part. I stood up, I talked to him, and I told him the plan of salvation. I told him that G- who Jesus Christ was, and that if he knew Jesus, then he doesn't have to be afraid. Do you see that? He didn't have to be afraid. And so as I talked to him, I then asked him the obligatory question, would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? And he nodded, yes, with tears coming down his eyes, right? Hey, listen, it was so traumatic that day that everybody in the room, his family members, they all kind of walked out to get a breath because it was very stressful. I sat down at the end of the bed because Andy was with the family uh, working with them. I sit down at the end of the bed, and then I was looking. All of a sudden, I realized I'm not in there by myself. I realized there was something on the the side to the left of me, right? And I was like, okay, it was like a haze. And I thought, what is this? (laughs) I must be overly tired. (laughs) You know, when you see things and you think, what is this? And so it starts to come, and it's coming, and I can see it moving, moving closer to the man. And as the man begins to uh, deep breathe and have shallow breathing. You just saw the end today. I just saw it. I saw it over him, and then I saw it come right upon him, touch him, and then it disappeared, right? And then right then, uh, a few moments after that, the uh, nurses came in and said, he's gone, right? And I thought, okay, this has been one heck of a night, right? And so I went home. I went home and went sound asleep because I was exhausted Next day I get up, I go talk to the father. I'm like, Father, what was that all about? You know, can you, can you help me to understand this? And he said, Sharon, I allowed you to see an angel. And I said, what? He goes, yes, because I send the angels to go pick up those that are passing away, to bring them before me. And so I allowed you to see that. I was like, whoa, a mist like that? And then he showed me in scripture where that has happened. And I'm like, okay, Father, right? And so why did he give me that experience? I hadn't had it before because I am to tell you people about it. I'm to tell you about it. Why? Not to puff myself up or anything, but to let you know that there is a real thing called angels. There's a real thing that angels come and get you at the end of your life, and they bring you and usher you before the Father for for this judgment period. Does that make sense? I hope so. So listen, the basic line I want you to walk away with today is knowing that the spiritual world, the world, is real, and you need to be on the guard, and you need to understand it. You need to read scripture, or you need to talk to somebody that can can help you to understand it, okay? And I know I've taken pot shots and poked holes, and some of you guys are are really um, into the spiritual movement, right? And I've said all spirits are bad. Don't do it, right? And stuff, and I know that, but that was intentional because I feel like that's what the Father told me, okay? And so um, I'm up here after, and you can come challenge me. You come talk to me. And I'll be glad to talk to you about that. So we are discouraged from any, uh, any uh, paranormal thing that we're supposed to be involved with. Even angels, I don't think we're supposed to call them and, and you know, make them bigger than they are because they're not. Uh, there's something that God uses to do his work and his bidding, right? And then 
God does encounter, he does encourage us to counter a, a ghost, but it's the Holy Ghost. Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about, this last point. The Holy Ghost, right? Well, the Holy Ghost is not the words we normally use. You read about that in one of the, the, um, the, the Bible versions called the uh, King James Version, right? And so the King James Version refers to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost. So what is the Holy Ghost? It's the third person of the Trinity. It's, you know, Father God, the, the Son, right? The Son of God is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, right? The three of them make up the Godhead. That's what God is, those three parts. And so the Holy Ghost is something that God deposits in our heart when we believe, right? And then there's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and I want to talk to you. And nothing in Christendom causes more angst in people's lives than when I start to talk about the Holy Spirit, right? And so I want to kind of show you uh, what I think about the Holy Spirit, and I see him moving. And I'm going to use a long scripture, but I think if you hang with me, I'll come back and summarize this and show you what I'm, uh, what I'm seeing, what God does here. It says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Hmm. That's the question today. That's the question of this hour. That's your question God is asking you right now. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, in this passage, Paul is talking to some converts that he has in the Ephesians church, right? And so he's been traveling, and so he's back in Ephesian, uh, the Ephesian area, and he's talking to them, uh, the people there, the converts, do you, have you received the Holy Spirit? That is the question he's asking them. And this is their answer. No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Whoa, so Paul goes, oh my goodness. Well, then Paul asks, then what baptism did you receive? And they respond, John's baptism, John the Baptist, right? John's baptism, that's what we received. And then Paul said, oh, let me clarify for you. He's clarifying for us today, right? John's baptism was a baptism of what? Repentance. Repentance, getting your heart ready. And so Paul uh, opens that up and says, uh, John the Baptist told you or told the people to believe in the one coming after him. He was just preparing the way for the one that would come after him. And who is this? Jesus, right? Jesus. And so he says, upon these people hearing this, this truth, what do they do? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, meaning that they were water baptized because they decided to believe that it was Jesus Christ who made the difference, right? Not just the heart that wanted to change, but that the power came in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what that's saying. That also endorses water baptism. And I can't go off of that to tell you that. Listen, on December uh, 5th and 6th, we have a baptism here, the big old baptism will come out, right? If you're a believer and you haven't been baptized, you need to do that. That's an outward symbol of something that God has done inside, right? So thought, thought, thought. Okay, so, um, so they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now watch what happens. Then Paul places his hands on them. I love this part. He places his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Woo! <laughs> that Holy Ghost stuff, right? I'm playing with you, but this scares people, okay? Here's the reality. For conversion to happen, one's heart has to be tenderized, right, to want it. The repentance of leaving your culture. That's what that is. You want something. You know it's not enough. You're looking for some other answers. And so when you turn your gaze upon Jesus Christ, right, and you call upon him and his salvation, that's a game changer. That's a game changer, right? You are saved at that point. You are, you are reconnected to the, you know, to the divine is what happens at that point in your life. It's huge. And here's the th reality. The Holy Spirit is dropped inside you at that moment in time. So don't let anybody tell you if you haven't experienced the Holy Spirit. No, salvation. The Holy Spirit comes inside of you. Now, interesting thing that Paul is getting at here, so don't miss this. Interesting thing that he's getting at is that, that when we lay hands, that's just an elder. He's just an elder in the church, just somebody who loves the church. He lays hands on them, and all of a sudden, they're given supernatural gifts, 
right? And so I want you to know that, that God works this way with us, right? He allows you to, to uh, get to a place where you're not happy with your life. You're looking for other things. God's prompting that. That's the Holy Spirit, actually. Prompting you to want to know these things. So he's talking from the outside, though, at this point, trying to prompt you to look. And then when you hear the message of Jesus Christ and you give yourself to Jesus, right, then all of a sudden the healing comes in, the reconnection to the Father comes in, right? And then, he, then he's going to deposit the Holy Spirit. So my young people say, Pastor Sharon, why couldn't God just do boom, bam, and get it all done in one whack? Why does it have to be this separate laying on of hands? Well, listen very clearly. God wanted us to understand that nothing comes in the way of salvation. Salvation is nothing you or I could do. It's a free gift that God has given us, right, through his son, Jesus Christ. He wants us to understand that, right? And so this justification through his son, it's salvation and nothing, you see, the minute you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, he loves you just because. He's not going to love you anymore if you did anything, right? If you remain just who you are, he would love you and accept you just where you are. This is huge, right? And so we need to understand that's why he separates it out. So this whole idea of the Holy Spirit that is evident when you lay hands on somebody, well, what is that? Well, that's calling what's already there out. It's giving it air. It's giving it the ability to express itself in your life. You see, we say, come Holy Spirit, because we're talking about that spiritual element coming alive and being aware of where it's at, right? And so we need to know that the Holy Spirit is something that God wants to give us, but he doesn't, he doesn't make it confusing. He says, first, just do salvation, <laughs> Let's get that. And once we got that, I got a whole lot of other things for you, right? And the Holy Spirit is along those lines coming about. So he will give you gifts. And listen, you don't need to squirm in my service. If you don't want prophecy, you don't want the tongues. Oh, my gosh, I want to be weird. You know what? You don't have to have them. You don't have to have a good relationship with your spouse either. You don't have to have freedom from drugs. You do not need to have any of that, Right? But God gives us an opportunity by giving us the Holy Spirit to help us. Amen. Important. So that's why he separates it out. You need to understand that. And then when he gives us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has the power to allow us to do things that we never thought possible. Right? So the, the question of do we really need it, the answer is yes. I mean, just look in the New, you know, look in the, uh, New Testament at, um, uh, at Paul, no, Peter. Peter was uh, one of the disciples that Jesus, right off the bat, had him come and join his posse, right? And so he's like one of the original. He's one of the three, right? So he's like this big, huge dude. Anyway, he comes, and he's with Jesus for three years. He eats with him. He drinks with him. He's watching all these miracles, right? I mean, he's getting the inside track on what, who Jesus is. But you know, when Jesus needed him the most when he was uh, at trial and going to be crucified, do you know what Peter was doing? Peter was in the back room denying him. That's right. He was back there denying him. Why? Because he loved Jesus, but his flesh couldn't go there. He could not participate. He didn't have the strength to go there, right? And so it's not his bad. It is the human condition. It's just too hard. And so you see, we see this same figure Right? We see the same figure here where, where Peter, in, in 50 days, he's going to actually uh, be uh, standing before thousands of people pronouncing who Jesus Christ is, like in all boldness and assurance, right? And so what was the differentiating made, you know, difference there? What made the difference? Well, it's because Pentecost came. Pentecost was infilling of the Holy Spirit. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he found this newfound strength to not care about his life, to be able to stand and proclaim the truth to anybody, anywhere. That's the difference maker. And so do we need the Holy Spirit? You betcha. I know this girl does. I know I do. And I encourage each and every one of you. And you can let him in as far as you want or keep him at a distance. Because that's what God gives us. He gives you a choice. So if we want this, we want to encounter the Holy Spirit. Uh, to, you know, how can we do that? Well, you can come forward. At the end of this service, we'll lay hands on you. And we'll call the Holy Spirit uh, to infill you and, and to freshen you. But here's what you got to want. 
You have to want to invite. That's a willingness. You want to invite the Holy Spirit to show up. You know, every time I get up here, I say, it's my practice to, to, right, to call the Holy Spirit. Well, why? Well, I do that because I am so stinking strong, right? And there's nothing I can't do, right? Nobody I can't beat up. I mean, I, that's my personality. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps, girl. But when I start by saying, come Holy Spirit, what I recognize is my total dependence upon him, not myself. I can do nothing, right? But he does everything. He's the one who will make a difference in your life. And so I ask him to show up, right? I ask him to show up, and I encourage you to ask him to show up. When you, when you sit down to talk to him, right, and you go to read his word, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't even understand it half the time, invite the Holy Spirit. Just say, come, Holy Spirit. You know I can't get this stuff. Come and help me. And I'll tell you the truth. He wants you to understand it. He'll show up. But you've got to invite him to show up, all right? Another thing we can do is you can invite the Holy Spirit to change you, right? Again, uh, God is a respecter of our personhood, so he never pushes us. He never drives us, right? He woos us with his love is what happens. And so this element of change, here's what I've realized. I've realized that we're really good at fooling ourselves, right? I mean, uh, refining your character, you see things that go on, but you know you're going to justify it, aren't you? Yeah? Yeah, we are. Okay, that's only me. Nah, that's you. We all do this, right? So it's really hard to get a beat on what's going on in our lives. But when you ask the Holy Spirit to come, right, he comes and he, and he brings conviction, right, in our heart. Like, oh, I missed that one. Ah, yeah, that wasn't what you wanted for me, right? When we ask him to come, he brings a conviction, right? But he never brings condemnation, he never can tell, you know, tells you, get out of here, kids. You're not good enough. Yeah, you're just a screw-up. He doesn't say stuff like that. He doesn't. He comes alongside us, and he helps us. And so it's important to know that the Holy Spirit will partner up with you. And if you've learned to pray a prayer that I have, which is this one, I say, Father God, send, send your Spirit so that I can recognize if there be any wicked way in me, because dang on it, I know there is. I just can't see it. Right? If there be any wicked way in me, come, Father. Come, Holy Spirit, and show it to me. Why? So you can say I'm bad? No, show it to me so that I can repent. I can change my direction. I can line up my behaviors with what you say. Right? So when we start to ask the Holy Spirit to come in, he changes us, guys. But you've got to invite him in. Because one thing I know, he will never, he'll never come in and push his way in. And then lastly... We have to invite the Holy Spirit to fill you, right? We have to want to invite the Holy Spirit to fill us. It's not like a one and done, right? Hey, I got saved. I'm filled. I'm good. It's all good, right? No, 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 no. Here's what I found that happens, okay? Here's what I found happens. You ask the Holy Spirit in, right? And, and it's like a, re, a refreshing it's, it's like being dunked in a pool over and over again. And it's a fun experience, right? It's really a great experience. And so when we ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it's like, Lord, I'm tired, right? Oh, I hear that many of you are tired in this room. And God says you need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, right? And so we need to know that we ask, we invite a fresh new filling. And it doesn't have to become because the music's like, whoa, right? It can happen in the quietness of one's heart when you ask to be filled again. He'll come and fill you. Now, guys, I have just spent an hour of your time here today, right? And I've been talking to you because I believe that God said that he wanted to tell you the truth, right, about things. Not so that you knew how to handle Halloween. That's just some fun stuff, junk stuff. What I want you to understand is I want you to understand why you have the hope that you do in your heart so that you can be ready to answer because there are people that don't know Jesus, that are in your sphere of influence, and God wants you to be able to talk to them about the hope you have, right? About the assurance you have about going to heaven, about being totally loved and forgiven, right? And so in order to do that, you had to be told truth today, and so you were. And then there are some of you, and I've been praying for you. You know, I war in the heavenlies for you guys. There's not a day that goes by I don't talk to the Father about you folks right? And I ask him to release and to free you guys 
So I know without a doubt that there are people in this auditorium today and you've been messing with astrology and, for, you know, the fortune teller and the palm readers and, and, and witches, the, the black magic stuff, right? And, and God's saying, come away from that. That is not him. There's no such thing as a good and a bad. There's the bad. It's bad. Don't do that because it's hurting you. It's like poison, right? It's like poison. And so he says, come away from that. So I hear that call very clearly today. And then mm, I hear, and I've seen it in every service, there are folks that are in here, and you're like the disciples that, uh, that the Apostle Paul came and found. And you know the name of Jesus, and you have your heart wanted to change. You just never put the two together and made a commitment to him to ask him to be your personal savior, to open up that understanding, right, that relationship. And so today God said to me, he wants me to very clearly tell you about this so that the things in your life that are kind of off and you never know if you're standing on firm ground, you know, that you're never sure about that, God says that has to do with your commitment to him. You see, if you give your life to Christ, you'll be able to, to, to note the difference, right? And so I want to encourage you today, we're going to go to prayer. And I believe that God is calling to a few of you in here and to some of you online. You think you get away with it, but you're not. Online, Holy Spirit's there on you right now. And you've been surfing and you're here and you're hearing. But today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of decision for you. So I'm going to stop talking and start praying. So everybody close their eyes. Get in a, a posture of prayer. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come even more than you are right now, Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd fill up this auditorium. I thank you. I thank you for truth. I thank you that you go through the, the, uh, the cameras, Lord, that you're speaking to people even now, Lord God, that you're using that to speak truth into their lives. And so, Holy Spirit, just come more. And I know what's on your heart, Father. Your heart are for people that they don't understand that if they give their whole self to you, that it's a game changer. That they're like the disciples of John the Baptist. They, they started repentance, but they stopped it. And so they haven't finished that process. And so Holy Spirit, I ask that you come upon the people right now. Right now, Father. And if that's you, and you're never quite sure, are you accepted by Christ? Is, is it going to be okay, you know, the way you've lived and things you've done? And, and you're just not sure, then I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me right where you're at right now, right? And so here's how it's going to go. I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy, but I want to know who you are. And I think in the spiritual realm, it's a pushback, saying no longer will I be pushed around by this. Right? Today I will declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Today it's getting settled. And so I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand in the auditorium. And those people online that are watching online, there's a button and you can just hit it. I raised my hand. And that way it'll come back to me and I'll know who you are. Okay? So right now, if you're in the auditorium and you want to make that decision in that prayer, I want you to raise your hand right now. Just slip it up. I can't see really well from this stage, so just got to wave it up so I can see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I see you guys. All right, you can put your hands down. You can put your hands down. I want you to repeat. And those of you watching on you re online, you just repeat it right in right in where you're at, right? You just say, "Father God." Go ahead. You can just do it now, even in the auditorium. "Father God, I give my life to you. I accept your son Jesus Christ." as my Savior. In the best way I understand, Jesus, I ask you to be the leader of my life. And so I accept the filling of the Holy Spirit. And from this day forward, I will never be confused. Okay, for you that were praying that prayer, listen to this. Father God, I just seal it in their heart with the spiritual authority you've given me in the eyesight, I see that you have written their name in the book of life and that nothing, no spirit, no, not even themselves, can remove themselves from you, that you have attached to them. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask now that you would come and that you would begin to help them to take the next step 
to move forward, Father, in the, the child, uh, God says, you are a child of the God Most High, and he has a plan and a purpose for you, and it is for good and not for evil. Believe him, walk in that truth. And so, Holy Spirit, just come, coddle them, grow them, Lord God, and I thank you. I thank you that you have sealed that in their hearts today. Now, Father, take all these words and these concepts that we've talked about, Lord, and I ask, Father, for those that had ears to hear what your spirit was saying, that it would drop upon them and they would be moved, Lord, to respond as you say. I thank you, Father. I thank you that you love them. I thank you that you put my heart is to love them because that's a work that you've done, Lord. Watch over them and protect them. Cause them to be like sheep that come into a pen and they can be cared for and no wolves can devour them, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Well, as we are getting ready to do our transition now uh, to back into worship, we have another song. What I'm going to do, I know I ran a little bit late, but let me finish here. If you gave your life to Christ today, I want you to tell me about it. On the tab that you have, you can fill it out, put it in the clear box on the, uh, the side as you're leaving. That'll come to us, or you can come down front and get prayer. I'll be up here with my prayer team. All right, and for those online, there's a way for you to respond. You need to be telling somebody about it so that you can grow in that decision and understand it. And for those of you that call Vineyard your home, right? Well, right now is the time for tithes and offerings. And on the screens, you're going to see ways that you can participate and give, right? But I want to remind you, like I remind myself, I tithe. I give uh, to the church, but I really don't give to the church. What I do is I give it to the Lord. And I believe that the church will steward it well, okay? And so it is an honor and something the Holy Spirit has taught me how to do is to be able to follow his command, which is to, to be able to give back to the family of God, okay? All right, have everybody stand up. I'm going to have you stand up. My worship team's ready to go, so I'm going to speak a final blessing on you, and then we're going to go right into worship. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would continue to come and fall upon your people, cause them to be mighty, courageous and uh, yes courageous and mighty people that can take their city back father and that can everywhere they go will be light that will be flooded lord and that the those that are far from you would come home those that are wounded would be able to be seen and the captives would be set free and you're going to do that in every person's lives that are in this room today in jesus name